All right, I've got a lot of material to cover and it's going to tie in with Brian and Brendan's material who are right after me. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'm talking about obviously how big companies, big tech, are going to sort of uh, impose their will in a way in healthcare. And, um, and I'll do it when the remote goes. Hey boys, oh here we go. Give me one second. Uh, there was a, a CEO poll done recently on who's going to have the biggest impact um, on healthcare, and Amazon won by far with 60%, Apple at 14%. And I think actually the way it's going to wind up, you might want to just flip that. And what's interesting to me is that Salesforce wound up with 1%. And if you think about it, EHRs are really just CRMs, you know, with essentially different fields. They're flat, they're flat field databases, but kind of with different fields and more information. And I think Salesforce is going to be more impactful than you think, and Walmart is really going to be impactful. The technologies that are going to have the biggest impact, I think you take the top four of this. Uh, interoperability, I think, is going to be the, the one that's going to affect all these companies the most, because now all 270 EHRs are going to be able to talk to each other the information will all be equal and we'll finally be able to uh, make inferences from those. And this is all about disruption, but it's a different kind of disruption than Clayton Christensen type disruption. It's more this type disruption. It's a disturbance that interrupts a process. And uh, are you going to take my picture with this face, really? Are you going to try and do that? All right, whatever. Um, it's the type of disruption that Netflix did. Uh, who did Netflix disrupt when they when they came about. Right, but you know what else they disrupted? The entire world of entertainment. They turned everybody into cord cutters. Uh, and with projects in Hollywood now, the first place anybody goes is Netflix now. Netflix completely changed all of entertainment in kind of a lateral way. They didn't think, nobody expected them to do it. They just thought they were going to take down Blockbuster, but they wound up disrupting in kind of a lateral way and completely changing the entire industry. And um, But I think that's not going to last, and I'll explain to you why in a few minutes. And if healthcare by your business is so bad, why does everybody want to get into it? Um, hey, can y'all tell I just found my Apple Pencil? I just started working on my Apple Pencil. Yeah, it's because that's where the money is. U.S. healthcare GDP is $3.5 trillion. Russia's entire GDP is $1.6 trillion. What's interesting, I read last night in 1980, China's GDP was $90 billion. Just $90 billion. Isn't that crazy? But uh, 3.5 trillion out of a 17 trillion dollar economy is why these large companies want in. Apple says now that they are want to be remembered as a healthcare company, and J.P. Morgan says that they're going to have 15 billion dollars in revenues by 2021, which I think mostly is going to be the watch, and up to 313 billion by 2027. All right, that's healthcare. What's interesting about that is. That's about what Apple's total revenues are right now, is 300 billion-ish, and they're saying in eight years, is that eight years, that that e equivalent amount is going to be in healthcare, all right? Apple is completely dedicating themselves to the healthcare space, and why are these people doing this now? It's data, and it all started with the Healthcare Act, which I guess was about nine years ago which essentially demanded that everybody and put in EHRs and start getting all this data organized. Uh, when my father was a doctor, his EHR was a three by five card in his pocket. Everything's changed now and the data is valuable. How many of y'all pay for, for Facebook? Right, why is Facebook worth $300 billion? It's the data. And that's unscrubbed data. I can tell them that I am Mickey Mouse, right? And that my hobbies include air hockey. And to them, that's the truth. But the data you get out of a hospital, for the most part, is true. And that's what gives that data such value. And I'm going to tell this story with sort of an analogy that involves the Chinese game of Go. There's a great documentary on Netflix called AlphaGo. Have any of y'all watched it? It's a, Go is a game that's at least 2,000 years old. It's kind of like chess, but more complicated. The grid, I think, starts at 17 by 17. 
but it was always thought because it was such an abstract game that there was no way a computer could play it because computers can't think abstractly. And so Google got their DeepMind AI and first they got it to play the world's best Go players. Then they got it to play against itself over and over. They got it to iterate thousands of times and they finally thought they could beat the champion Lee Sedol right there uh, from South Korea and there was a five game series. And what happened was the, the computer won the first game. And then in the second game the computer pulled a move that nobody in the entire history of Go had seen before. And it was known as moves, now known as Move 37. You can just Google Move 37 and you'll, you know, it's that well known. And it was a move that no one had ever seen before in the entire history of Go. And the computer thought abstractly enough to think it up itself. And what was interesting about it, and there's Lee Sedol's reaction, he actually got up, left the room, and went outside and started chain smoking because he couldn't, he really did, he couldn't believe what had just happened to him. But look what a magazine wrote after this. Was Move, this is Wired Magazine, was Move 37 the seminal moment in human development? All right, not in the game of Go, but in human development. All right, what do they mean by that? I think it has something to do with the abstract thinking that the computer was now able to do and the inferences it, it was able to make. Healthcare for a long time has been ripe for disruption because it's had old technology that's been siloed specifically in doctor's hospitals and in um, doctor's offices and in hospitals. And when you're a large company like Apple and you're looking to grow, healthcare is the only business with enough scale to move the needle. Apple can't go into small businesses. Uh, people thought that the Apple Watch was a small business when they went into it. Well, the Apple Watch generated $15 billion in revenue over the last year on about a 40% margin, which is $6 billion net profit, right? Netflix last year generated $1.5 billion net profit. So this little watch that everybody made fun of, right, netted four times as much as all of Netflix last year. All right, and, and Netflix's gross revenues were about $140 billion. That's why people are interested in it. It can move the needle for these larger companies. And all the data right now is in hospitals. This is my home hospital in Augusta, Georgia. My dad was born there. My dad, who was a doctor, trained there. He practiced there for 40 years. He died there. He met my mom there. She was a nurse there. Um, both my kids were born right there. Um, my ex-wife was born there, and my ex-wife still works right there. <laughs> and so the kids ask me sometimes, they're like, Dad, why are you always reading books on structural engineering? And I'm like, oh, you know, no reason, kids. It's just, <laughs> it's just a hobby, you know, lifelong learning. You know, reading is fundamental. It should be something you look at all the time. No, anyway, she's great. I'll tell you all a weird story in this hospital. I think hospitals are magical places. And in this hospital, uh, when my uh, wife was born, she's my ex-wife now, but I'll call her my wife. When my wife was born, my mom was in the room. So she was one of the first or second people that my wife saw was my mother. Fast forward 55 years later, my mom is in University Hospital in the emergency room, my wife, who is now a doctor, walks in, takes a look at her, and, and gives me the goodbye look, like, this is it. So I went up and said goodbye to my mom, and then my wife went up, and she was, uh, you know, combing my mom's hair while they gave her, I guess, some Ativan and some fentanyl or whatever to make her feel better. And she went to sleep and never woke up again, but think about that. The, one of the first two faces my wife saw on planet Earth was my mom. The last face my mom saw on planet Earth is my wife, was my wife. Isn't that weird? Magical things like that happen in hospitals. It's where we come into the world. It's where we leave the world. It's where healthcare used to be centered, but now it's all about, it's not only that, it's a data institution. It's not just a healthcare institution, it's a data institution. And when I think of AI, I think of it more as 
machine learning and, and AI, I like to tell people, think of it as acquiring information and then building on it. Because that's what we're doing with all this information now that we're getting. Think of AI more as, and you're gonna hear about this in the next two sessions, as ambient intelligence. In other words, taking all this information coming from different places, you know, Internet of Things places, I won't go into it too much, but like the Disney bands. How many of y'all have worn the Disney bands at Disney World? All right, what it does is you can open your rooms with them, you can pay stuff with them, it follows you around the park, it figures out what you like, what you don't like, it'll find your kids for you. That's ambient intelligence. It takes different types of information, combines it, and makes inferences from it. And interestingly enough, the guy that developed those magic bands, I believe, went to work for, I think it was Kaiser. But what we're dealing with in healthcare now is all this disparate information. Now we're being able to sort of consolidate it and combine it and use it and make helpful inferences from it. And hospitals, nobody has more data than hospitals. And I'm going to show you why. It's coming from all sorts of different places. And these companies that are wanting to get into it, what do they all have in common? We sort of trust them, or at least we trust their logo. Our caveman brain thinks this way. It's like, if I've seen this before, relax. This is how we survived a million years ago. Otherwise, run like hell. Well, the same thing now is when you see Amazon, you're pretty cool with Amazon. You know you can kind of trust Amazon. So that gives Amazon a bit of a head start as they get into healthcare because people already trust them. People trust CVS, people trust Google. And you know, when I talk about Google a little bit more, I'm gonna show y'all, people are a little squidgy about Google right now, but I'm gonna show y'all why you might wanna trust them even more. But all the data right now, all the big data is centralized in the 4,500 hospitals that we have in the United States. And so the question is, are these companies, when they come in, are they competing, with, are they competing against the hospital or are they augmenting what the hospital is doing with patient care, all right? And let's start 10 years ago, Walmart was freaking everybody out because they were getting into healthcare. They had 4,000 stores. People thought that they were gonna open health clinics and 2,000 of them. Everybody was completely panicked. This is what they looked like. Everybody thought this was gonna flatten the distribution curve of healthcare delivery. And it really didn't happen, but the big impact that Walmart had, because they have such scale, 135 million people go into Walmart every week, is that they introduced the $4 prescription plan and it stuck in a lot of institutions, right? So that's the thing that Walmart did that changed medicine. And they're doing a few more things now because of their scale. They have such scale that they're able to uh, sort of voice new things on us. I tell people all the time, Walmart is not a store. Walmart is an IT company. And I'll give you an example of how strong an IT company is and how it uses ambient intelligence. It knows when a hurricane is heading towards Florida, all right, it knows every day what people are buying. But it also has computers that track the weather, which is another type of data. It combines that with what people buy and it infers what people are gonna buy in certain areas when hurricanes hit. So if a hurricane's heading towards Miami, Florida, what are people going to buy? There's two main things. And they get ordered by Walmart with no human intervention. What are you gonna be drinking tonight at the uh, karaoke event? Beer. At the very least, beer, right. So that's one thing people want in a hurricane is beer. So if you're drinking beer, if you're sitting in your lawn chair awaiting the hurricane, uh, in Miami, Florida, you're drinking beer and you're, all, what else do you want? <laughs> Strawberry frosted Pop-Tarts, all right? Nobody in their right mind would put those two things together, right? That that's what people want. But by using the computer, we're, they were able to make inferences that nobody would have really been able to think up themselves and inferred it thought in a really abstract manner. By the way, those are the Pop-Tarts, the strawberry frosted ones, where if you hold them down in a toaster, they start shooting up sparks. Should all try that, it's a blast. <laughs> try that tonight at the karaoke party. Be a lot of fun. But anyway, nobody would make that association in their right mind. But the computers with enough information 
we're able to do that. And that's one of the things that makes Walmart such a player in healthcare. But here's what's really making them a player in healthcare these days is their centers of excellence. Walmart is opening, uh, they have, I believe it's 13 centers of excellence around the country. And what those are are big hospitals like Mayo. Here they are. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, Geisinger, Virginia Mason, Mayo. And let's say we're in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're going to have open heart surgery. Walmart will pay for you and a companion to go to Cleveland Clinic to have that surgery done rather than have that done in town. All right, Walmart has two million employees, so that's kind of a little thing right now. But let's say the Fortune 500 adopted that. The Fortune 500 has 28 million employees. At some point, if this thing takes scale, it really affects local hospitals, right? If, if all the sort of expensive, high volume, you know, profitable, for lack of a better word, uh, types of procedures are being sent away, local hospitals are gonna be left out in the cold and that's something that everybody needs to pay attention to. They've also now, I believe this happened at the beginning of the year, Walmart started charging, like I've used telemedicine four times, I think, and it's like 50 bucks. Walmart charges their employees $4 now. So it's like the $4 prescription plan, they're sort of setting a new price point for telemedicine, which I think is gonna stick just because they're so big. So they're gonna have effects because of their because of their scale, for instance, they told all their leafy green suppliers, we want in four months for all you guys to have your entire supply chain on the blockchain. And they did it, and now, you know, if they have some bad spinach, rather than taking seven days to find out where it came from, it can take two and a half seconds, right? By the way, how many of y'all have a working familiarity of what the blockchain is? I'm gonna explain it to you in 30 seconds, if that's okay. Everybody tries to make it more complicated than it is. What it is, it's a giant Excel spreadsheet where certain people have permission to share certain cells on it. Once you enter something in a cell, it's immutable, and when you add new information onto it, you add a new cell onto the, onto the end of the spreadsheet, ergo blockchain. That's all it is. Think of it as a giant, it's more like Google Sheets, but think of it as a giant Excel spreadsheet and Walmart is pushing that standard across industries now. They're the only company that can do that and people watch them and Walmart for instance gave us this whether we like it or not and it's in all our lives now. All right, CVS is the next one I wanted to talk about. The interesting thing about CVS is they already have 9,800 retail locations. They've got twice as many physical locations as Walmart does so they're very prepared to actually take care of patients at least in a primary care sense. And they've got minute clinics, although they haven't been opening as many of them as they did before. In their 10K, they said, we are a pharmaceutical innovation company, but the emergence of new competitors, the people I'm talking to you about, may exclude us from narrow networks, so we, we may need to do uh, something else. They have two trends that they're looking out for the aging population and increasing consumerism. And because of that, they're combining and it's gone through with Aetna in a vertical merger, all right? They're taking care of the physical needs and the pharmaceutical needs, but they also are taking care of insurance. And I think you're gonna see a lot more of these. But the fact that those two guys are combining gives them so much data from the insurance end and um, from the uh, pharmaceutical end. It gives them more data than anybody else. Now, some people think the reason that they did this was it was all about Amazon. They were scared about what Amazon was going to do. In fact, they, the head of the ex-head of Aetna said that Amazon is scaring CVS, and this is why CVS is doing the deal, and that may be the case. Uh, there was an Aetna Humana deal which just failed. That was a horizontal deal, so people are going vertical now, and that's, that's what these guys are doing. But the Aetna boss says, if you look at the bottom, we now have 10,000 new front doors to the healthcare system. And they do, and that's twice, as, that's more front doors to the healthcare system than all the Walmart stores and all the hospitals in the United States added together. So that gives them scale to flatten out the distribution curve of healthcare delivery, all right? It, it actually may, 
It might work. Have any of y'all read this book? Good, because it's really not all that good. But that's why I'm here. I read these books so you don't have to. And it did make a couple of interesting points, one of which is when two companies combine, the intangibles can't always be guessed, all right? What's going to happen is not always obvious, and the rationale for doing the merger might not be all that clear, but it can create new opportunities. By the way, I read a book last night. It just came out. It's by Scott Adams, the guy. This is like book club now. It's by Scott Adams, the guy that does uh, Dilbert, and it's called Loser Think, and it's about organizing your thinking. It's about productive thinking. It's really not what the title sounds like. You should read it. It's absolutely fabulous. I read the entire thing last night. All right, so CBS has a huge advantage just in terms of physical locations. Are they going to compete or help hospitals and other types of, of healthcare delivery? They're going to compete. Google, I'll tell you right, right front, I believe, is pretty much only doing good things. Uh, they tried to have an EHR effort uh, back in 2010. They closed it down in 2012, but last November, I remember me talking about DeepMind that was playing Go against Lee Sedol. That AI now is Google Health. They've plugged that AI into Google Health. That's exactly what it is. These are some of the initiatives that Google has in healthcare, and as far as I can tell, they're all benign, all right? They're all to the benefit of patients. They're not competing with hospitals or other healthcare providers. Google, as we all know, when you start typing, when you start Googling something, they're the masters at predictive analytics. And when you start applying that at scale, you can come up with some really cool stuff. This is a study that Google funded. It came out of January, in January 2018. Kind of got a boring title, Scaling and Accurate Deep Learning for Electronic Healthcare Records. And by deep learning, it, we mean AI. And what they did was they took raw EHR records they were anonymized from two academic institutions, so they stripped out the names and the address and the social security number and all that kind of stuff. And it wound up being 216,000 adult patients. All right, that's a lot of patients. That generated 46 billion data points. All right, so if you divide that back, that means that each person, each patient was generating roughly 250,000 data points. So when I talk about there being a lot of data in hospitals, Think about how many patients go through a hospital in a year and then multiply that number by 250,000. And a lot of that is, you know, beeps on the EKG machine or whatever, but it's still data. So this is where all the data is. But what is fascinating is you see this, this acronym, A-U-R-O-C. I'm going to go ahead and show you what that means. If it's zero, that means area underneath the curve. That means the model, your hypothesis, is totally wrong. And if it's one, your hypothesis is totally correct. And what they were able to find was uh, inpatient mortality, they have a 95% degree of confidence that 24 hours after admission, they can tell whether or not you're going to die. Uh, there used to actually be a code for that, but they took it away. They thought it was rude, but it was called FTD, fixing to die. But they were able to tell 24 hours after admission whether or not now, by examining the data, 24 hours after you're in there, they kind of know whether or not you're going to die. They know with a 95 degree uh, confidence inter interval that 30 days uh, at, at discharge, whether or not you're going to be back there in 30 days. And to hospitals, the way they get paid, that is super, at least by the government, that is super important information to know. And if they can predict that, that's an amazing thing. Plus, 24 hours after admission, they can tell whether or not you're going to be staying with a 95% confidence interval, whether or not you're going to be staying um, longer than 24 hours. And this kind of all goes back to the, the Pop-Tart um, beer thing. It's stuff you wouldn't have expected to find, all right? But by sifting through the data, they found things that they didn't expect to find. It's sort of like Vioxx. Somebody was actually, bless you, sifting visually through the VISTA system, which is the VAZHR system, and noticed all these mortality sort of blips on patients that were using Vioxx, and that's what gave away, that was one of the things that made people realize that Vioxx might, might be hurting people. Another interesting thing they're doing now is they're using time as a variable. So let's say you give somebody 
um, Vioxx in the morning and give them Plavix in the, or, you know, three hours later. Well, not only does it note, bless you, not only does it note that you've taken those two medicines, it also notes as a variable the time interval between when you took those two medicines, right? So that's a new variable now. People hadn't thought about doing that before, but they've thought about doing that now, and it's leading to new inferences and ways that we can look in medicine. DeepMind, Google, who I've been talking about, has been working with the National Health Service and um, specifically with kidney injuries, and uh, it's been working, but they're doing something different. They're not trying to predict uh, acute kidney injuries. What they're trying to do is when somebody's in trouble, figure out the AI is trying to figure out who do we call? Who's the best person to call on this? This is the NHS's uh, algorithm for acute kidney injury. Do y'all want me to explain this to y'all? I'll do it tonight during band karaoke. That'll be more appropriate then. But what's interesting is you see the red marks there. Let's say someone's serum creatinine is above a certain level, but not too much above it. Uh, you see that alert right there. It will go ahead and page the appropriate person in the hospital. Let's say that's a nurse. You know, it didn't get the whole team in there, but it knows who the appropriate person is to take care of that specific condition. Whereas if somebody is totally crashing, according to the decision tree, it'll go ahead and get the whole team in there immediately. So rather than a bunch of people calling each other and getting them in the room, the computer goes ahead and assembles the people in the room that need to be in the room based upon the readings they're getting in the room. I mean, that is a super inventive way of using things that we wouldn't have thought of five years ago. But now that we've got this data organized, we're kind of able to think about it. By the way, last week, um, well, Google bought Fitbit, right? But also, uh, Apple released their earnings last week, and their iPhone sales were down 9%, but their wearables sales were up 54%. All right? Wearables are the future of Apple. It's not the phone. It's wearables and healthcare. But what Google slash Alphabet is doing is they are throwing money at different kinds of, of research products, and some of them are really cool, and some of them involve electronic healthcare records, which is all, where all the data is that I've been talking about, and so business is begging uh, to be disrupted as we move from a world where it used to be you had to prove meaningful use, now you have to prove interoperability, which means that Cerner needs to be able to talk to Epic which needs to be talked to everyone else. They at least need to be able to exchange a base level of information. And this used to be kind of done sideways through something called HL7. And HL7 is essentially based on a data format called uh, XML, which weirdly is what your Word format and your PowerPoints and your Excels are, are stuck in. But we've gone further than that now. There's a subset of, of it called uh, the FIRE standard, and how many of y'all have heard of the FIRE standard? That's, there's two things I'm going to tell you I want you to take away from this talk, and the FIRE standard is one of them because you're going to be hearing a lot about it. That's the standard, usually in the form of an API, that, let, that lets one EHR talk to another. I don't know if y'all are old enough to remember this, but do y'all remember WordPerfect? Remember trying to get WordPerfect documents into Word? All right, until somebody wrote a script that was able to sort of translate those two, it was a giant pain in the butt. Well, the FIRE standard is sort of the equivalent of that, and it's a big, big deal, and uh, Google bought a company called uh, Apogee. Uh-oh, I think I just got my daughter tickets to Hamilton and Nashville. Holler. <laughs> I told my daughter, there's no way I'm getting them. I'm going to be on stage. She's like... Dad, I'm your daughter. And I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, API means Application Programming Interface, and G means Google. And so what Google is doing is getting right in the middle of trying to solve the problem of letting all these 270 EHRs talk to each other, which is a good thing. They're also heavily into genomics. How many of y'all have had 23andMe done? All right, I had it done, and it told me, I had it done seven years ago when it was early, and it told me that I had glaucoma. 
And I was like, ah, I got glaucoma. So I went to my ophthalmologist. He's like, you know you have glaucoma? And I was like, yeah, I pretty much all I have glaucoma. Uh, because what it does is it takes my information, and you also tell it outside things, like is your hair curly, do you have a gut, all these kind of things. Can you taste bitter things? And it combines all that different data that I was talking about and makes inferences with other people's data. So it also told me that I have a 35% higher chance of having uh, colorectal cancer than the normal male, which is a good thing to know. And is making a lot of money for the guy that gives me colonoscopies, all right? He's making a fortune. It also told me things I wasn't sure I wanted to know, like I have statistically, I have some of the wettest earwax in America. <laughs> and I was like, what in the world am I supposed to do with that information? But then it occurred to me, I can put that on my Match.com profile. <laughs> Let's see what happens then. And I got some really weird answers off that, but some kind of interesting people. But anyway, Google is heavily into genomics. And what's crazy about genomics and what I love is, this is the biggest advance in the last 20 years. Uh, 12 years ago, if you wanted to get your genome scanned, 23andMe, by the way, scans about 95% of your genome. And your genome's only four gigabytes big. So think about it, you're, everything that makes you, you, your entire genome takes up less space than a DVD of The Hangover. Isn't that a little bit depressing? But anyway, uh, 12 years ago, it would have cost $10 million to get your genome scanned. Now with a coupon, you can get it done for $99. Isn't that amazing? There's no other industry where that's happened. Google has also decided that they're gonna cure death. They think death is a disease, and they're gonna figure out how to cure it because they want to figure out how this pretty lady who smoked her entire life, Jean, how do you say Jean in French? Jean, Jean Calmet, how did she smoke cigarettes since she was 20 and lived to be 122? And she actually only smoked until she was 110. Um, she died at 122, but at 110, her doctors forced her to stop smoking. And she was like, why? You know, en coulez-vous, I'm not gonna stop smoking. Does anybody speak French in here? I just cussed in French. I'm not gonna stop smoking. And they were like, we pretty much have to make you do this because your eyesight's so bad, you keep lighting your hair on fire. <laughs> so that's why they made her stop. But how in the world is this woman who's smoking these horrible guitans or whatever they're called in France, how in the world is this woman you know, alive? And that's what Google was trying to find out. And a lot of things, it turns out, Simple things can keep you alive longer. For instance, the, uh, the blue line is men. And as you go from left to right, that's the age gap between you and your spouse. And for men, the younger your spouse is, the lower your relative risk of dying is. Then there's the red line, which is women. The, the higher the gap is between you, you being older, your spouse being younger, the faster you're gonna die. Life simply isn't fair. But it's been done multiple times. I'm not sure exactly what the reason for it is. According to this study about coffee, I'm gonna live to be about 1,200 years old, <laughs> which is nice, you know, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and take it. The one that I'm obsessed with now, and I want y'all all to look at uh, at some point after you leave the conference, is sauna, something as simple as a dry finish sauna can do crazy things, and there's multiple studies on this. There's meta studies on this, but those who hit the sauna four times a week, 170 degree sauna, are 60, if you're 50 years old, by the way, are 60% less likely to suffer a stroke over the next 15 years, just from the sauna. Isn't that crazy? And if you look at the bottom paragraph, you can see that you, there is, you do the same thing, you have 40% lower all-cause mortality just from the sauna. So it may be just simple things that help us live longer, and those are the things that Google is looking at. And by the way, if you do the sauna four times a week, um, you also lower your chance of Alzheimer's by 40 to 50%. It has something to do, they think, with you're sweating out the metals that somehow or another interact with uh, amyloid proteins that they think cause Alzheimer's. And the reason they think it makes you live longer heart-wise is that it makes your veins and arteries bigger, 
while you're in the heat and increases blood flow. There's a word for it. Vasodilation, maybe? I think that's sort of the word for it. And it activates heat shock proteins. But just something as simple as sauna, not all these fancy studies, may help us live longer. And Google is studying all these things and has, has implemented something called Project Baseline, which takes all these things I've been telling you about, combines them, and they're doing a giant meta study to see exactly what good health is. Because it might not be exactly what it, what it seems to be. It might be that I'm the picture of health. I kind of doubt it, but it could be that that's the fact. Because, you know, they keep changing what normal blood pressure is, right? That number kind of keeps going up and down. It's like, this is what it's supposed to be. No, this is what it's supposed to be. We don't know. So Google's big project is trying to figure it out. And one other thing that I love in terms of combining different types of information is there's a study Google funded with a really boring name. But basically, somebody said, what if when your ophthalmologist takes a picture of your retina, all those pictures are kind of standardized, right? Somebody said, what if we took all those pictures, combined them with the data from people's electronic healthcare records, right? And they did that. And the upshot is by looking at, uh, at your retinal fundus, which is the back of your eye, they can predict whether or not you're going to have a cardiac event sometime in the next three years by looking at your eye, all right? Once again, that's kind of the Pop-Tart beer thing. It's these unexpected things that are coming up by making these associations and inferences in data. Is Google going to compete or are they going to help people? Google, I believe, is totally going to help people, as is Apple. I've talked to them, I've talked about them a bit earlier. Apple has to get into healthcare to grow. And Tim Cook last week overtly said, we're going to be remembered as a healthcare company. But they didn't mean to be until they started getting all these letters from people with Apple Watches saying, you saved my life. This Apple Watch, in fact, every five minutes sends my heart data uh, to USC because I'm part of a, a meta study with 400,000 people with Apple, Apple Watches contributing to it. So it's a huge medical study. And, and they, eventually, you watch, your insurance company, your health insurance company, is going to be giving you Apple Watches for free. That's pretty much where we're heading with all this. And Apple is moving from hardware to software services if you take a look at, um, at their income statements. Here's what I showed you before, that in 2027, they're going to make as much from healthcare as they are from everything else right now. It's absolutely incredible. And um, somebody has you know, crunched the numbers and said the Apple Watch could add two years to your life. And it does do funky things, like if you're sitting down and your heart rate, if, you're, if it knows you're sitting down and your heart rate is above 120 for, I believe, 10 minutes, it asks you if you're OK, you know, because that may mean you're in, I can't remember the name of it, when your heart goes too fast. Is it AFib? Yeah. I always think if it's real slow, I can remember it. It's, uh, I remember it as Marsha Brady Cardia. Brady Cardia is when your heart goes too slow. And I just remember it as Marsha Brady Cardia. Um, but anyway, if you fall down, you know, it knows how your arms swing when you fall. And it can tell you whether it'll ask you, are you OK? And if not, it'll go ahead and phone uh, your health care provider that you have listed on your iPhone. Apple looked at doing medical clinics. They decided not to do that. What they're really interested in is electronic health care records living on your phone. And what's fascinating is, you remember me talking about, this actually happened this week. You remember me talking about the FHIR standard before. These are some of the data formats for the FHIR standard. Well, in June a year ago, Apple said, all right, if you as a hospital want your electronic health care records to be on an Apple device, they have to be in the FHIR format, in the FHIR standard. And that's when it really took off. At the beginning of 2017, what year are we in? 20, at the beginning of 2017, there were about 14 hospitals working with Apple. At the beginning of 2018, there were about 200 or 300, I believe. At the beginning of the year 2019, there were between four and 600, is my understanding. And now there's 1,100 hospitals working with Apple. 
All right, Apple is basically, whether we like it or not, going to be where our electronic health care records on a personal level wind up. All right, Amazon, the one that everybody's scared of because nobody's better at efficiency or um, price transparency or logistics. They scare everybody because, you know, their attitude is if something runs at 10 meters a second, you know, most companies are like, ooh, how can we make it run at 12 meters a second? And Amazon's like, are there any laws of physics that prevent this from running at 100,000 meters per second? They just think differently than the rest of us. And in terms of healthcare, these are the three areas I think they're thinking about, but they all tie back into the interface, the Amazon interface. Amazon has its advantages of customers. They've got fantastic logistics now, and they've got more data than you would believe. The CIA keeps it there. Uh, Amazon Video competes with Netflix. Where does Netflix keep its movies? On Amazon's computers, all right? Cerner keeps their EHR records on Amazon's computers. The most profitable part of Amazon right now is their data operation. That's what's funding everything else. These are a lot of their, um, their projects, and many of them uh, adhere to the HIPAA standard. In pharmaceuticals, people uh, got really freaked out a couple of years ago because Joe Kernan announced that Amazon's considering getting into the pharmaceutical business. Oh, no. And everybody freaked out, even though they'd already been doing it in Japan, because in Japan at the time, you could call your pharmacist and you could make, put your order once you had, um, not your pharmacist, your doctor. Once your doctor gave the okay, you could place your order through Amazon and it would be delivered to you prime same day. All right, they had already been doing that. And Amazon loves delivering like packets of Prilosec as opposed to 1,600 pound gun safe. It's a lot more profitable for them. Uh, but then Amazon kind of dropped out. Nobody knew what in the world was going on. Well, it turned out that they were buying PillPack, all right? And I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of PillPack, and what that instantly did was gave them the ability to ship pharmaceuticals to 49 states. And in fact, if a lot of y'all are Prime members, you've probably already gotten emails saying uh, you're able to participate in PillPack uh, right now. They also want to be and the hospital medical supply business, so Cardinal and McKesson really need to look out because they're really pushing this hard. Uh, they're going into things like carts and gowns and printers and that type of thing first, but slowly they're gonna work their way into pharmaceuticals, which they can do because now uh, between Whole Foods and Amazon, they're within 10 miles of 164 million people in the United States, all right? Only Kroger, Costco, and Walmart have a closer distribution reach. But like I said, they're going to try medical supplies first and then pharmaceuticals because pharmaceuticals are just harder to do. By the way, uh, recently Amazon filed for a patent where when Alexa listens to you, it can decide whether or not you have a cold by your coughing while you're sitting on your sofa. And it'll say, uh, do you want me to order some Robitussin for you? which is kind of weird if you think about it. Gets even weirder. You know, for 99 cents, you can buy Samuel L. Jackson's voice to replace Alexa's voice. How weird would it be just to be sitting there minding your own business and Samuel L. Jackson's like, take some damn Robitussin now and order it from Amazon. I'd order it real quick. But that's really crazy. It's listening to you all the time and able to determine whether you have a cough. By the way, the next iteration of the AirPods is going to, rumor has it, take your temperature, which makes perfect sense. So not only will it take your pulse, it'll also be able to take your temperature in your ear. So all these things that you're going to be hearing about in the next couple of sessions all sort of tie in together and give us more data that can go into electronic healthcare records, which Amazon wanted to be in and then decided they were just going to work with Cerner on. They got more interested in this project you hear about with uh, J.P. Morgan and, uh, and Berkshire Hathaway, where what they're doing is there's no deductible on the health plan. They just kind of rolled it out. The health plan within those three companies, there's no deductible, and you make money the better your health improves. And, of course, they're going to monitor that through your watch and through blood pressure measurements and all that. But the better care you take care of yourself either the lower your premiums that are going to be 
or you're going to be getting cash bonuses. So they're going to gamify you taking care of yourself. It's a little bit like um, Progressive putting that thing in your car where if you drive safely, you get a discount. They're sort of applying that to healthcare now. And, um, and when it comes to Amazon, this is in 1997, they said, we don't think short term, we think long term. And I think that's totally what they're doing with healthcare. And this is not an original idea of mine. This comes from a guy named Ben Thompson, who writes a, uh, a newsletter called Stratechery, which you should all read, and he's a super smart guy. But here's his thesis, which I believe. So first, Amazon, we're all familiar with Amazon's interface, and we're comfortable with it. So they're going to use it with J.P. Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway, and the pharmacy benefit managers and the insurance administrators. All those people are going to get used to that interface to order things. Then, as they start going to hospital suppliers and ordering things, everybody's still going to be on the standard Amazon interface. Then, as it grows and grows and grows, more and more people are kind of going to be forced on to the Amazon interface. This is called aggregation theory. It's a bit like if you write a, uh, if you decide you want to write a book now, um, basically your only shot is to do it and publish it yourself is to do it on a Kindle, right? And there's a certain interface and set of rules that you have to follow. And I think that's what Amazon is aiming for in healthcare. Everybody gets drawn into having to use that. So what that does is bring more customers in for Amazon at a lower acquisition cost over time so they have the winner take all effects of aggregation theory, which is really true truly kind of brilliant if you think about it. So these are the areas they want to get into. Well, I can't go back again. You heard about the areas they want to get into, but I think in the long game, what they're trying to do is get into the interface. So are they gonna compete or augment what you're doing? Uh, what, at least what hospitals and, and healthcare providers are doing? I'm not completely sure yet. But if we go back to the start, you see Amazon scares 59% of the CEOs. Once again, I say that should be Apple in order. I believe it should be Apple, Walmart, and then Amazon. And this in order should be interoperability because interoperability is gonna drive everything else. The AI, the data analytics, and the telemedicine, and all this data right now, more data than you can believe, is living in hospitals, which takes us back to the game of Go. Uh, in move 37, Lisa Dole got beat, but in the fourth game, Lisa Dole pulled a move, move 78, which no one, and he, the human, pulled a move which no one had ever seen before, right? And this is my last slide in the back, by the way. Um, nobody had ever seen this before. And he beat the computer with an abstract move that no one had ever seen before. And once again, magazines were saying in two moves, AlphaGo, which is Google, and Lisa Dole redefined the future. They didn't redefine the game of Go. They redefined the future. In other words, I know, I know. In other words, they redefined how computers work with, um, uh, with human beings, and this is how, all right? It's not human versus machine, it's human and machine. The machine's move 37 was beyond what anybody ever thought of, but then came humans move 78, and you have to ask, if Lisa Dole hadn't played those first three games against Alpha Goal, would he have found God's touch? which is what they call move 78. So the machine that defeated him also helped him find the way. And that's what I think is going to happen in healthcare. We're going to have all these tech companies coming in, doing things that we've never thought of before, like Pop-Tarts and beer, things that we've never thought of before. But what that's going to do is inspire humans to come up with ways to help patients that we heretofore never would have thought of by ourselves. Thank you very much for your time and attention. See you tonight at uh, karaoke.